Actually, again, it's interesting and worth your time. So I um, I made a PowerPoint because I had some, well, because it's easier, and I had some responses to the session from last time that I wanted to address, um, and I thought that might be a really good place to start. Um, I've had one question that's interesting that I only got this morning, so I haven't had much time to think about it, so I thought I'd think about it on my feet and share that with you to the best of my ability. Um, and someone sent a really cool article, so I want to have a look at that as well. So we'll we'll kind of just see where we get to, and I'm just going to babble on and hopefully um, address your questions if I can get to them as well. Cool. Okay, so let me move on from here. <laughs> this worked really well yesterday. Oh, okay. I'm I'm going to I'm not entirely convinced this is the best way to do this today. I'm just going to read these things while we're here. Hello, hello, thank you. Okay, now we get rid of that again. Uh, we're definitely in the right spot. I'm just, I think I'll just do it this way and we'll see. Um, here we go. I'm just going to hold it here and you're going to have to cope with the ugly aspects of this. It's going to be easier for all of us. Okay. So this is from someone who, who watched the last one. And I actually was supposed to go back and listen to what I'd said so I could relate it, and I totally forgot to. But I'm going to read this out, and then it will remind me. So the last session helped me clarify, helped me clarify my thoughts on our OT here. The lovely young guy in that space had been pushing her for some reason in the last couple of sessions, and she got quite angry with him the other day and really pushed back. I'm actually glad she did, as I want her to be able to stand up for herself if people try and make her do things she doesn't want to do, but I'm guessing that's not the way he's seeing it which is surprising. He may have input in his work context, leading him to pressure clients rather than build relationship. So I needed to follow up and sesh. the session today has helped me feel more confident in doing so. Thanks. As you say, the outcomes of the work, your work are not prescriptive or expected. And it's it's in there. And I, you know, the whole of today will be about this as, as generally they are and probably last session was, is is the person's front and centre and what they need is. And we're so used to kindly telling people what we want and the support workers, wonderful as they can be, um, come from a society that is informed in a certain way. Um, they may be trained in a certain way. Very, it's growing, but but it's so subtle, this way of getting people to do stuff as opposed to letting them fill up the space and then um, make decisions for themselves about what they want and teaching them how to do that as opposed to teaching them to be um, almost sidelined by the needs and wants of the rest of the, the, the day or the family or the et cetera, et cetera. So making space for people to be allowed to grow, the, the person who we're talking about here um has been diagnosed with intellectual disability as opposed to autism and we've been working for some time which I'm sure is fine to say so it's been very interesting watching her grow and develop into herself and develop into herself in ways that people just haven't expected because our expectation of people is you know as I say a glass ceiling especially when we're looking intellectual disability it's your brain's broken there you go boom you can only have this and you get a support worker in who thinks that and how can they not and then ding, 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 we go around our day like that it's terrible so so she's learning to fill herself up and um and articulate when things aren't aren't right 
which is just beautiful. It's just making space. All of this work is about making space for people. And what I really liked at the end here was, you know, thanks, as you say, the outcomes of the work are not prescriptive or expected. We don't know what's going to happen with these sessions. I, I have no idea if, you know, a metaphor for it is unblocking a river, you know, rivers of, of the body, et cetera. But, but, you know, you don't block a river. It'll go where it wants to go. It's got power. It's got motion. It, it can get stymied. And that, and so whatever we're doing with the work, whether it's the, the psychological aspects of it or the physiological aspects, or for me, they're both and they're linked and they're the same thing. Um, and you can't do one without the other. And one works, they work better together. But once you unblock it, the person just gets off and running. So I get all these, I get, I get these kind of outcomes because I think that's a great outcome that she got angry and pushed back. I think that's a fantastic outcome. She was acknowledging her boundaries had been um, impacted and was sticking up for herself. Beautiful. But we didn't teach her how to do that. There's no education in having boundaries. It's just that I see from this work that when people, when their physicality works better, their, their neurosensory system works better, they know where they are in time and space, the brain knows where the body is, there's more connection, they then have boundary. It's implicit boundary. And I see everyone I work with, I see this in greater or lesser degrees where they know who they are. And I'm not teaching them to know who they are. I'm helping them be in their body better so that they feel stronger. And it's it's such an interesting thing. But if you don't direct the outcome, if you do just clear the river and get people better connected, they they have a very interesting time being who they are in the world. And we just help them do that, you know, get stronger and stronger at doing that and being who they are. And and watching, as I often say, a new hero emerge, they start emerging and they see who they are in context of things working better or executive functioning might be working better, eyes might be working better, capacity to articulate might be working better. But then that that means that you've changed a little and you see the world differently and then the world sees you differently. And then that that shifts you get you get to be more but we can't know what it is so it's a you know it's a constant unfolding it's lovely um the next thing i got was also a response this is in two parts because it was long and it's worth being long um i really like it when people very kindly and respectfully pick me up on things I'm more than happy. Um, and the person that sent this is great um, and loves the dorsal vagus like I love the dorsal vagus. Um, so is, is, is making a really valid point that I wanted to share. So it's a little bit long, but I'm going to read it all out anyway. So I just started, I'm just going to go back before I do because someone said, Oh, great. Hello. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so I just started listening and love, love, love this. My only note so far is referring to the real world, which is what I did. I can't remember the exact context, but I said something about bringing people into the real world or having access to the real world, something like that. And you know, I'm, I'm not doing a huge mea culpa for that. It's very hard to find language on the fly that works and it, sometimes it works well enough and it does, you know, but it doesn't mean we can't come back and backtrack and go, actually, let's let's tease this out because it's meaningful. And I totally agree with what this person's saying. Excuse me. So in my mental health, disability, social justice, activism, I decided some years ago that the label real was most often a subtle pejorative choice as it implies the opposite option, which is not real, which is perfectly sublime, which for me is most definitely not true. I chose instead to say 3D world to clarify that for me, online connections are just as real and in fact, as a dorsal vagal led person, 
online connections. I'll go back to that because they give me heaps more sense of physical safety, e.g. for being able to choose when to be seen and heard or not and have totally helped me liberate much of my psyche from ventral, vagal, supremacist, supremacist tropes of connection, the language of which gives me pure joy. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back and dissect all of this. The person who's written this as a real issue appropriate issue too with um people people loving the ventral vagus and the capacity to use the ventral vagus as um as the penultimate which you know I often talk about as well so I sing dance read and listen to poetry talk and share cultural experiences with real friends and communities online they aren't just aren't in 3d Ah, okay, that's sorry. That missed me when I was doing this before. I understand that video games are not always interactive with other humans. In that case, I would label them as solo activities with interactive cyber worlds. Mario Martinez, the clinical neuropsychologist researching cementarians and the impact of culture on biological health, takes himself out for dinner alone once a month to practice the benefit of this worthiness exercise. So... I, I I love this being brought to attention. Um, I'm going to go back and just bring this this first one in first. Is I I think it's really important to delineate the the importance of language, the importance of what we consider real. Hence, hence the pull up with this thing. Um, it's it's also for me. I would add it's not even just online things. There's you know there's a there's so much understanding and and the science community starting to move into this understanding where nonverbal communication is huge. It's it's more. It's it's most of of our communication actually, and so. There's a way in which we we hold the ventral with this this highest, um, uh, like the highest efficiency and and the highest goal of being able to connect like that. And people will go, oh, I'm at my best in my ventral Vegas. Not everyone feels like that. Not everyone feels like that at all. Some people are far more comfortable in a dorsal led state, and they're not exact states, as I say in the course. And if you haven't done the course I recommend it because it allows you to understand the the foundational work that we're discussing in these talks as well as you can see what the exercises are you know to a greater or lesser extent um so I this is a quote from an article that I wrote on the dorsal states and I think it's really important because it, because of the way that we can assume that our way of seeing and being is the best way and the only way and the real way, and it isn't. And it takes a lot of subtlety and it takes someone, you know, sending that thing in as well, just to, to, to gently encourage an opening to, to, these, to these other realities, these other ways of being, um, which a lot of people function better in in lots of ways. So this is my quote, what if, because we have lost the ancient language of the dorsal states, we miss the vitality and vast intelligence that is staring us in the face? What if, and not in a paternalistic way, there was something autistics, et cetera, I would add, had to teach us something we have long forgotten? And so I touch on this in the course a bit, but I, I wanted to go over it again because I, I just, you know, it, it was earmarked by this by this message I got from last time. Even with the first slide I showed you with that um, girl being pushed around, bossed around, boundaries intruded on by her support worker, there's a way in which if you can't do what I'm doing as well as I'm doing it, you're not doing anything. If you can't do what I'm doing as well as I'm doing it, there's nothing going on in your head that's of any real value. And 
that is where people miss the point. There's a huge amount of value going on. You might not be able to read it or see it or hear about it, but it's there. And the best support workers I've ever found understand that. They understand there's a whole other world going on in there that they might they might not be privy to, but they they trust it's there. As opposed to my, my reality is the only good reality. And then we then we get to start to be able to communicate with the person in a way that's meaningful to them but you're learning how to listen to what that is for them. And you might never understand it with your brain, with your, well, your left brain, your ventral brain, whatever you fancy in that, in that realm, but you know what I mean. You might, it might not have intellectual meaning, but it doesn't mean that there isn't meaning. And you if we're paternalistic about that and if we go, oh, you know, that's all very nice, but this is better, you've missed the point again. So I like this slide that I made and I'm, I'm pretty sure I've put this in the course. I'm, I must have done. And it took me ages to do and, it, you know, it's what it is. I love it. But it allows us to explore the way in which if people are in an immobilized state they have access and capacity to things that you can't necessarily have when you're in a more on state or a more ventral state um and it's really hard with the polyvagal theory because people like to be very cut and dried about it as opposed to as as Paul just says you know you have a cascade of different um things going on in the body and the the oh, that's not what he says anyway the it's never one thing or the other completely you know you if you can see my my arrow you you might be plotted here in the middle here sometimes you might be you know rummaging down towards the immobilization with fear shutdown state sometimes you might be so high nervous sympathetic you're just in a hyper vigilant state that you can't get out of you know, people who are um, really highly immobilized slash profound autism slash profound autistic inertia might be right back down here again. But what's interesting is if they're right back down here, they also know how to run along this bottom line. And they know this space well. They may or may not know a ventral state well, and it doesn't mean that the whole ventral system doesn't work, um, it, which is some of the criticisms of my work. Like I'm just saying you don't have a ventral vagus. Of course you do. If you can move your face, your ventral vagal is working, et cetera. Like it's there, but it might not be robust. It might pop, pop out quite quickly. Mine's not as robust as the other people's. It's what it is. So... Um, we can move move around here, but this this bottom line is parasympathetic line. And so, yes, in order to connect with people, even from a ventral state, you need to have dorsal connection because you need to have a parasympathetic connection. But when people play in this really low realm, um, immobilization without fear is is a high order state of. Um, meditation it can be so where we can go into a coma at the the other end at this end our body's in a good place the heart rate's down the digestive system is not necessarily operational and ready to go it can all be quite slow everything's very gentle you know with with um nursing with feeding babies there's there's flow from the breast there's connection there's eye contact but it's all soft and so and yeah, you might be digesting, but it's it's uh, slow. It's the it's the it's after you put the meal in, and then you have to go and lie down and digest it, kind of thing. There's, there's gradients and ways and waves that our body goes into in different places. In this nice soft space, we can go even more into um, uh, uh, 
an insular-ish kind of space where we're not at high ventral and not using our facial features. When you go meditate, your facial features aren't, aren't in operation. You don't need them. You also don't need to be eating cake. You've, you've gone into a, a, a nice isolated kind of place where you can connect with people, but from a very different space. And you're registering information differently. You're registering nonverbal information differently. You're accessing different parts of your brain. Different parts of your brain are alight, engaged. The choreography of your brain to your nervous system is different. And it produces a different kind of intelligence. It produces a different kind of um, uh, way of being, in a sense. And so if you've been hanging out down in this place for a really long time, i.e. your whole life, that's what you're good at the most. That's your dominant mode of understanding. This is loose. It might not be exact in scientific terms, you know, and if I struggle to find the right words so that I get a tick of approval from people who understand the polyvagal theory inside out, I've lost the, any meaning I, I have to, to functionally discuss what this is at a person level, at a as a living level, as a how do we work with people in this space level? Because if we can meet them here and understand them here and know what they know they're real in this space, then we can do something with it. And I don't mean to fix it. I mean, you connect here and you validate it because it's real. And maybe that person knows more than you'll ever know about this place. And maybe they can access things that you'll never know because they can do stuff that you can't do. And maybe their brain grew or was already like this so that it actually has a higher order choreography to do certain stuff that you'll never be able to do because your brain was taught to do this or born like this and there's a lot of chicken and egg going on there which is fine so we come in knowing this and and connecting with people in this way you just get a lot more out of them if nothing else because they they get seen but also they might have something to teach you and then also if their body only knows this and you try and make them learn something else and you don't at least validate this as perfection as it is, you're, you've made them fail and you've made them wrong before you start. And also, if their body really knows this at a body level, at a physiological level, it doesn't necessarily know how to get up to that other place easily. So you have to make them feel safe. You have to make the body feel safe so it's ready to mobilize into a different state. And that different state might feel inaccessible. That different state might be very, very foreign at a physiological level and a mental level. So where it's you're comfortable being being in a certain state and you go fine we'll just teach you this it's like it's not that easy and people are plotted all over here so I'll get I'll get a mum to to model the ball exercise for someone so that they can see what it is before they have to do it so they stay safe and the mum and and this is where everything gets very very interesting in terms of being exact so bear with me the mum might be able to go into a wonderful meditative state very quickly. So in 10, 15 minutes, I can get her to go on the ball. She can do three or four rounds. Whoop! Her body completely knows how to jump from, from sympathetic to, you know, a fairly deep parasympathetic state and can be in a, um, a very restful place. Face reduces, face gets flushed, eyes soften, heart rate goes down and, and feels softly connected to self in a nice way and that's easy for her to do so I'm obviating a little and I'm jumping around a lot today but bear with me that's where I can plot her on this 
but she might be up here somewhere if you can follow my arrow she, up the ventral vagal complex say she might be halfway up back up there so she's good at coming down to a certain place and her body knows how to do that really well but it doesn't necessarily know how to go down deeper and so I can then teach her that if I bother at some other time, if we can find the time and she gets different gradients of knowing how to bring that body into a deeper, deeper state of stillness, which I'm starting to say, I have to award people martial art color belts like you do on martial arts, you know, so, you know, you get a green belt, or red belt, or black belt or whatever, and going deeper and deeper into these states. However, although the, the, the person watching, the client, her child might not be able to get their body into that place. They might, if you can follow my arrow, hopefully it's working, they might be good. They, they might take up the maybe the, the triangle around the, the other end. So they can go up the other end to ventral vagal. And then they, but they can also go across this dorsal vagal complex and know how to be in a deep state regularly that, that informs them beautifully and informs the system and informs the internal system that, that gives them a higher order awareness that's out of reach of the, the lighter meditative state that the other person can go in. So there's all these configurations of what our bodies can do and then what our bodies give us access to, which is why sometimes we go neurodivergence and, and neurovariance. It's like, well, yes, you know, some it's chicken and egg and some of it's born and genetic. And then some of it is depending on the state of our nervous system and where it can go to it, the, the brain morphs. The brain is accessing different things. So the more we get used to bringing the body into these different states, the more flexibility we have. And, and there's no perfection in that sense because, you know, you can have someone at the top of this pile and if we have a, a vagal ventral ladder kind of thing going on, a polyvagal ladder, which people love to do, which I hate, um, the top of the pile is great, but they might not have any idea of the complexity and wonder and connection and capacity to connect with other people from a dorsal vagal state, a deep dorsal vagal state. So you kind of want to be careful when you're judging people's capacities because yours are always limited as well and there's always more we can all learn. And I, I may have mentioned... I think in the course I might have mentioned it, but there's a woman, Diane Powell, who's doing stuff with telepathy and autistic savants. And she's a neuroscientist, biologist, neurobiologist, psychiatrist. Like she's about a million things. She's worked in, um, she's American. She's worked in the in Russia. She's worked in the UK. She's very high order. She does very, very robust studies very, very robust double blind studies and the scientific community still say what she's doing is rubbish because it can't be real because the only thing that's real is, you know, up here. And she does these studies where she'll, she'll investigate how well someone can read their mum's mind. So she'll go into um, one of her stories is she goes into this this 20 something year old's house and he takes 45 minutes to calm down because because his system can't cope with someone new in the room that he doesn't understand so he's all over the shop and it you know it can get a bit violent and just you know just not okay and in her story she says I in the end I didn't even know if I was just going to have to leave but instead he sat down and he typed because he couldn't speak and he said well verbally etc you know whatever um typed I mean so what do you want and she went, well, I want to know if you can read your mum's mind. So I want your mum to go into the other room and we're going to show her some cards and I want you to tell us what, what she can see. And he's like, yeah, fine, whatever. And so she goes and does that. Uh, and they had about a 99.9 .9 success rate or something ridiculous. 
he had this amazing telepathic capacity to engage with his mother without her being in the room, without any ventuagal thing going on at all. And so we need to be really mindful that the people we're working with are very, very interesting. And just because we don't understand whether they're interested, you know, what that might be or have any capacity to connect with it, it doesn't mean it's not there. And we can't blame support workers or any such people because they haven't been taught that any of this is real. In fact, it's always been negated and ridiculed. But when I was doing support work, I was always really careful to keep my mind quite clear. And I hadn't read that study. And I was still pretty sure that the people for whom this stuff wasn't working well, that there was other stuff going on that they their perceptive level in other ways was very, very interesting. So I think, you know, it's very, very interesting to be mindful of that. I'm just going to read my Q&A thing for a minute if I can. Okay, so from Tonya, yes, I have gained a deep understanding of my son who games online and what it provides for him and why, why he can now articulate, he can now articulate why, what, et cetera, following ART for all and doing this work. If not for this, I would still not understand how important this is to him and how he, his needs are being met. Yeah, it's huge. It's huge in lots of ways. Um, he's also, if I may, he's just got this huge intelligence and people, um, they're, if they can't speak it, you think it's not there. And I, it's really big with intellectual disability, I find, huge, because, because people are immobilised. You know, there's this profound inertia and the brain is where these, these dorsal aspects of the brain, for one of any language that I can find that's proper, um, they're present, they're, the witnessing self's present, but actioning body and mind is really, really difficult, but it doesn't mean there's nothing happening. It's, it, it's a big thing for me with intellectual disability, just how, how we disadvantage people in that way and um, just what we could get out of them and help them if, if we took this track instead. Oh, where do I want to go? I'm just going to tickle through these because oh, there was one I really wanted to put in and it didn't save. Oh, did I? No, I think I did. I think I was going here. Bear with me. Okay. So this was, I, this was, put online in the Vegas study group, which I like on Facebook um, this morning. So I haven't had a lot of time to look at it, um, but it, it, it segues and it moves nicely from where we've been talking and, and, and I want to pick it up, which is um, they've, they've done a new study, like it's obviously very recent, where they're looking at mirror neurons and they're looking at the fact that the brain and the body are very inextricably linked. And in a sense, you want to go, yeah, of course they are. Um, and in a sense, I always go, yeah, our studies are great, but they're just telling us what we know that we've been told isn't true. And now they're telling us it's true again. So it's the limitations of science. So it's fantastic and it's wonderful, but it's not like it wasn't real before. And it's not like it won't be real after, but it does allow us language and, and to see what we know is true. That's, that's kind of how I see it. So this is playing around with mirror neurons. And for some of you, you probably remember or know, I think we talk about mirror neurons in the course, but I have always found mirror neur neurons really limiting um, because it's like we've, we say people or people with autism, their mirror neurons are broken or they're not working very well. And because they allow you to reflect back what someone else is doing and learn that way. And, and, you know, it's, it's how we learn by osmosis and et cetera. And that's great. Um, what they've found now from what I can read of this study is that the mirror neurons are just all over the whole brain, which to me is like, well, that makes actually more sense, quite frankly. Um, and what they're also saying is that 
the link with the body and mind is such that the thinking and planning, blood pressure and heartbeat and and all of it is inextricably linked to the body and to movement. And again, I don't think that's a big surprise, but it's fun and it's true. And so our movement impacts the brain. Our neuro, our, our nervous system impacts the brain. All of this stuff is linked all of the time. There's not one bit doing something here and one bit doing here and the mirror neurons here for a autistic brain aren't working and the boomer. And yes, you can have parts that grow more and, and, and network better, but we're going to get further with studies like this, which is which allows us to see the quantum aspect of the brain and, and the fact that the brain and the body are actually one thing. So where I wanted to go with this study, although I haven't articulated it very well, but I'll put it in the link and I'll put it up in the course. Um, so what happens if we're born into an immobilized state? If you're immobilized from birth in utero, um, it people will go trauma at that point. I think trauma is a really tricky language because we lay, we layer it with so much emotion. Um, so I think immobilized is easier. I, I like Porges' language here because trauma is loaded. You don't know what will trigger an immobilized state. You could have you could have the brain being being more, and it doesn't know how to wire up to the system well to start with and and that you know I, I say this in my book i said it years ago very lightly at the end but it's like this where you know you, the brain could be awake but that could that could be a trauma because you have you have you can witness the self in the uterus and that might be really quite freaky and that could be a trauma and you get locked in that state so it doesn't have to be something bad happened or the mum did something wrong or the mum didn't have enough of this or that or you know there's a whole range of things that could immobilize a system so if we put that to one side, because I think you're never going to stop all those variables. Instead, jump a bit, go, what happens if we're born into an immobilized state? Movement allows the brain to grow and develop. Movement allows us access to our brain. Movement allows for this wiring to wire up. Movement very much allows for the ventral to get wired up because when we're babies, we we engage with the world and we wake up our connection to our heart and our face in reference to the world by movement, whether it's look at my little fingers or there's my mother's eyes, et cetera, et cetera. And they go feel out some more. And, you know, Annette Bagnol was talking about this 10 or more years ago. It's not the only person that's ever talked about it, but it's what we do. And so if you're immobilized, for whatever reason, and your culture doesn't know how to move you out of that immobilized state because they say you've got a brain incapacity, your brain's not working properly, we don't know how to work with the body because we only play with the mind, et cetera, et cetera, um, they can't help you then. And then what happens if you 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 keep growing and your body only understands this immobilized state what happens to your access to your brain what happens to the way that the brain grows if you can't move properly if you have autistic inertia it's very very interesting to start looking at it from this way and then it's very very interesting to be really delicate about these kinds of questions because, because we want to remember what we were talking about at the beginning with the value of the dorsal state. We want to hold complexity. We want to hold a whole lot of variables so that we can look at this with a higher order intelligence because if we just want to go back into fix it mode, it doesn't work. We just, we, we miss something in the process of cleaning up autism, cleaning up this and that. But at the same time, wouldn't it be nice to be able to witness that baby, that young child, or for me, a 47-year-old, because it still works and we can do all sorts of things then, where you 
allow the person to come back and inhabit their body better and allow there to be mobility between the brain and the body, allow there to be more access. So there's this delicate interplay of doing that without overloading, overlaying your reality on the top of it. And, and it's, so this is a, this is, this is a point of inquiry that I'm doing here. All my work is about having a line of inquiry. We just, we're asking questions and we're watching and we're seeing and we're seeing where we can go and holding complexity, holding the tension and then seeing where it will give and what we want. I think it's interesting. I think it's interesting that we're starting to understand that all of these things are linked. It's interesting that we're starting to see how much mobility works. I have someone who's 47, who I worked with last year, who has very kindly, she asked me to record the sessions that we did. We did an intensive and has very kindly allowed me to transcribe them and I'm going to make them into a book because it's so interesting watching, because she's 47, very articulate and has done a number of things in her life to try and make sense of being born into a highly immobilized state, to make sense of being in, in pain a lot physically and then mentally and emotionally by the body being stuck in a distressed state, being highly intelligent, very, very intelligent, as well as living in this thing. And no therapy has been able to get her out of it at all. And it's not for one of trying. And then this did. And it's fascinating. And in a week, not long after when she got back to me, she went, now I can watch a movie for the first time because my brain can follow the whole thing. And so it's profound. It's wonderful. And that is really interesting because the choreography of her body only knew this and it was stuck and immobilized. And so autistic inertia works. And then autistic symptoms or reflections or whatever language is appropriate, and I will probably always get it wrong, ways of being, like being, um, one thing she said was she could not just watch a movie, but she watched her ability to run workshops that she would do and not um, have to be so directive and in charge of everyone in the room because her executive functioning and her working memory were working better. So she was able to remember what that person had said and let there be a little bit more room. So it was a, she was a little less hypervigilant and a little less um, chronic in her relationship with people, a bit more fluid more capacity because the brain had more capacity. The nervous system had more capacity. And it took the reality of her being a full and whole person to begin with, as well as looking at the immobilization of the body and how it presented like that. And then the link of the safety of I am this, this is what I am. And seeing if the body can move a bit and the identity can tolerate the move in the tension and the body can tolerate the change because it has been in such a fixed state for so long. Um, and there were so many changes with it. It was quite profound and dramatic and beautiful. So it's, it's this interesting place to go play. But if we don't stay low and in this dorsal land that I like to play in and describe where we stay very open and fluid with our understanding, we will quickly go into a fix-it model. We will quickly try and get people up to speed, up to scratch and whatever. Um, and then we miss the point. So, yeah, it's an interesting place to play. I'm just going to quickly read the Q&A um, in case I missed it. Okay, so from um, Tonya, who said this before, adding to this, he now knows how much he uses energy and how other people feel. He has these skills in place of facial verbal communication. Yes, yeah, see, I think that's interesting. Those skills are offline, 
you know, a lot, a lot offline or, you know, to a greater or lesser extent, not completely broken. But when the body comes into a better state, you have greater access to your ventral state. It, you have better access to it. It doesn't mean it's completely gone. It just means you have more of it when you need it. So there's a fluidity that we're inviting the body to know. But if we don't come in from an appropriate place, if we don't come in from um, a, it's if we come in from a paternalistic, I'm I've got the best reality. We've lost, and if we don't understand implicitly and it, you know it, it's why I recommend people do the course and have a look at the the layers of this of what I'm talking about we we just miss the the subtlety of where we're working and where we're playing and I like the polyvagal theory because it reminds us that this is all about safety the body will hold a configuration because it's safe and it will move if out of it if it feels safe and it's not going to go anywhere if it doesn't feel safe and you can make people comply but you don't get any change you might get outer change but but no great difference um so i hope that's interesting i'm just going to pause for a minute and have a drink of water there's there's a question that someone gave me, as I said at the beginning, that I, I'll pop up, I think, and we'll just have a little bit of a play with it and see, um, see where it works. Um, and the person who has written this, I think, is on here now. So I might, I, I changed, I changed some of the language so the person wasn't as identifiable. Um, Hopefully, I'm not, um, yeah. So I have a new client who is heir to a family business. He's in his 40s now and was diagnosed with dyslexia at 12 and with ADHD at 16. All remain untreated. I put a big flag there. He got into habits and self-medicating and seems to have his biggest problems in executive functioning. So I'm a brain spotter since 2015, PVT and Stephen Porges fan since 2016 and into IFS since three years Circle and continuity. Since October 2022, I served as a brain spotter for Ukraine. I got a lot of support, feedback, and assistance from senior trainers. I am currently making contact with senior trainers themselves, neurodivergent in Alaska, who are developing a neurodiversity BSP training. Um, all colleagues I contact about working with neurodivergent people say I need to take my time for an extensive amnesis, medical history, which I am doing. But the family, Father and family, um, most probably also neurodivergent, wants to do something and undertake action. So two things that they want to know is how do I find out what kind of coaching, counselling, treatment would yield the best results in the case of the heir? How do I explain to the family that there is no quick fix after 25 years? So I'm so curious about this because my first thing is, and you could probably answer it if you want to, just tell me very quickly um we haven't got much time but uh does the person themselves want the treat want counseling or is it part of the will or is it part of like who wants them to get well it, it, it is a very important question to answer <laughs> anyway I think all the time so that that was my first thing and obviously you know you wrote this swiftly last night and I have only read it quickly but I think in general, you really want to know whether whether the person themselves wants your help and whether um, whether it's for other people because it matters. Um, I'm curious with the treatment of um, ADHD and dyslexia. Um, I'm tempted to leave that a little bit. But for me, I mean, I, I understand why people have habits and self-medicate because they're trying to deal with their executive functioning. From where I sit, you know, obviously you know my work, I find the executive functioning changes so much when we um, get the body into a better place. And when we explain to people that that's possible, they're usually interested if we can show them well enough. Um, 
and so I, but I don't know what kind of coaching and treatment would you, I mean, I'd like to say my work, you know, but you know, my work's not available all over the place because there's just one of me for now. Um, but, and I don't know whether you've done the course and, and looked at the exercises. I think you have. Um, I'd want to know who wants the treatment that that you know what is if in the case of the air what does the air want do they want treatment do they want their executive functioning worked out um and then if you you know with my work I actually don't need extensive medical history I don't I don't ask many questions at all I don't read people's reports I don't care because I see where we are on the ground on the day and what the person wants and where their body's at and what they can manage and that's more important to me. So I think finding out what's important to the person is going to inform what treatment would work best. Spending time with the actual person, seeing what their needs are, and their needs might be very specific, and their needs might be around how to cope with running the family business with terrible executive functioning, and that may be what you're doing. Um, and so it, it may be that they need, you, you need to pay someone to support them to do that, et cetera, and, and train someone up there so that they can, they can take over tasks that this person can't do. That often alleviates a number of things because then they, the pressure's off them and they can, then, then they can maybe come in and help address things that they want to work on. How do I explain to the family and et cetera that there's no quick fix? I think I think it's really hard when you've it's really hard when you've got a family that want a quick fix. Um, I'll read your thing in a minute. I if if the family want a quick fix, I find it very hard to work with people. Because energetically, it's like you, you, whether it's my work or not, you're still you're still wanting people to soften. You're wanting them to expand. You're wanting them to learn something new. You're wanting them to grow. It requires safety. There's not a lot of safety when there's a whole lot of urgency that you're broken and people want you to get fixed. It's it's a terrible place of no healing. So that's tricky, and so trying to find ways. Um, with people who aren't educated in healing modalities necessarily or awareness of that. Often people don't have any kind of idea of this stuff. Um, to inform them, I would probably find some books on, on the problem so that they can understand the problem better first. I actually feel like you want to spend more time, like, Teaching the family is probably really important in that sense and spending time with them so that you you educate them to soften them, to get them to move away so this person's got some space to see what they want and need. And I'm going to read your thing, but I, 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 it probably depends on the urgency. Uh So he himself thinks he has no problem. All others are problematic, especially those who disturb his life. He wants a nice relationship and someone to be with and keep his job, you know, in his part of the business. Um, agree about the urgency. I got called in because he got into problems during a reorganization. Yeah, see, I think that's really tricky. It's really tricky because um, the the business needs to be managed and then you're in a really tight spot, so I'm not surprised that you asked in that sense. Um, mm. That's so interesting. It's it's it does you know obviously this story is a thing, but it the urgency is the same in lots of families where people just want their kid to get back up to speed so they can get to school and get on with things and have real life real life it's that again um and this person has their real life and they don't necessarily want to 
exist in that frame or be in that frame. So I think I would be very interested in taking some time, like proper time, not just quick analytic time, to map all of all of it really map who wants what who needs what what's required what would happen if if it didn't work if they didn't what what would happen instead for them if if it didn't work and he couldn't do it what would happen for him and then and then start seeing what it is you've got and taking a really big view I'd take a big bird's eye view for a while and then I'd tunnel into each each person each um, stakeholder and see what it is they need because it sounds like because of the 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 issue there's more people in the container than just the client which is full on um but it's almost there's an aspect of mediation that requires being done first because if he doesn't want therapy, you can recommend what you like, but it won't work, will it? So it, it may be that there needs to be an understanding of why the therapy would be useful and there's a choice to do therapy because, I don't know, you won't have any money if you don't because the money will go somewhere else. Like I've got no idea what the, what the you know particulars are, but I'd map it. And I'd, I'd get very intuitive once you'd done that about what people actually need. And then I'd go back and look at the possibilities of different counselling treatments and things. I would educate. I would find some good books on executive functioning stuff, um, dyslexia, ADHD, probably even the autism stuff would fit in terms of helping them perceive where he's at so they can have some clarity and uh compassion for where he is and what's meaningful to him so you you get everyone mapped and then you start knitting them together and you're seeing where you can find points of connection points of safety points of meaning and you see where where you can and what you can do there um as opposed to for me an extensive medical history like i i it seems like the pinpoint is him, whereas there's this big story here. And I'm not entirely convinced from this little bit that I've seen that his medical history is as interesting as his reality, which is interestingly where I thought we would end up from today um, because it's all about that. It's all about people's reality. And we're, we're very used to being clinical. We're very used to being... Um, right we're very used to thinking the real world's more important and the money and the machinations and the hut 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 you know kind of way of of making making the world the the real world real and it isn't it is and it isn't and there's people involved and they are um varied and lovely all right the fixing men this is from tonya the fixing mentality which i was and sometimes fall back into makes the person feel like love connection is conditional which simply adds so much distress which then in turn uses precious internal resources so safety first not the business or perceived deficits um yeah and then from the person who asked this question, great advice, totally agree, concurring with my feelings about that. Thank you very much. It's there. I'm not saying anything amazing. You know, I am, but you know, but you you get it already. And it's it's almost like we're we're having to kindly affirm these truths in the world for other people and hold the line. Hold the dorsal line, if you like, but hold the line for um, holding complexity and holding kindness and then educating people and not wanting too much, even don't want too much from the family. Like hold it all well and then see where you can offer. And I, I often use a waitress model. You're, you know, a waiter, waitress where you're you're there to serve people and you've got a range of things at your disposal that they may or may not want 
and it's your job to kind of give them the menu without overloading them to see what might be useful, what they might be able to digest on any day. Um, are they comfortable? You can't digest food unless you're safe. You can't take information in unless you feel safe and well met and it's a good time and your taste buds are working, which means you have to be open because they turn off when you're not. So, but all of these people are involved in this story, not just the client. And our knee jerk reaction is to fix it so everyone can get back to work. Uh, which we're changing, all of us. So thank you. I'm just going to quickly read these last messages. Um, I'll, I'll have a think and send you an email about book titles. Yes. All right. So that's it for now. Um, thank you for being here and listening and letting me play around with my um, terrible skills <laughs> um, with <laughs> technology. Um, I will see you again in about six weeks. Bye.